but uh, logic is your friend, so um, I'm going to be talking is that about... Is that lightning better than it was before? Yes. 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 Although we can't listen. I'm going to be talking about bounding the impact of AGI. Uh, I'm first going to frame the problem and talk about the solution which was uh, invented by a philosopher in 1978 or thereabouts. And, uh, <coughs> Then I'm going to be uh, talking about the difficulties with this particular solution. And I pushed a certain amount of framing the problem, which uh, actually appears in the abstract and how you derive these numbers and safety limits and this kind of thing into the appendix at the uh, urging of one of the referees, uh, basically, who said that I'm spending too much time framing the problem, so I won't this time. Um, so. I'm going to make a distinction between two kinds of AGIs, and I see the discussion here actually uh, in the past few days as, as sort of subtly shifting between one and the other. I'm going to be talking about animated versus automatic AGI. Automatic AGI will just blindly follow its utility function. It is an instrument, okay? It is a mechanism. We just had a comment from the audience on the previous talk saying that animated AGI will have its own purposes. Uh, which may of course be bad, you know, they may want to sort of uh, uh, do away with humanity, but it is an agent, okay, this is a huge difference between the two, uh, both in the everyday uh, um, language, the way we talk about uh, uh, automata. Uh, Aristotle already noted that sort of free will is a precondition of, of, of moral culpability. You cannot blame uh, uh, the river for flooding and, I don't know, destroying houses and people. Uh, uh, you know, um, the automatic AGI will just do what it will do, okay? Uh, the animated AGI is the one that we are a little bit concerned about here. Uh, and uh, uh, Alan Gebirth, uh, he argued uh, in a full book and then in a bunch of subsequent papers, arguments, counter-arguments, we'll get to that. Uh, uh, that what he calls prospective purposive agents, or PPAs for short, will of necessity behave in an ethical manner. So that, uh, 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 you know, Boston had just had, had, had this, this uh, orthogonal thesis presented, uh, uh, and the claim here, according to Gadeers, is that at least in the animated quadrant, this orthogonality is not quite uh, uh, true. It's not true that if you're, you're uh, intelligent, you can still do a lot of evil things. So that is the argument I'd like to, uh, uh, to present and turn it into something like a Gorenstein plan. And maybe there may be people here who know how the uh, uh, classification of simple finite groups came, came about. Uh, basically, Daniel Gorenstein went out uh, uh, in 1972 more than 20 years before the, uh, the project was completed, and, and argued specifically that there is a whole series of technical steps that you need to uh, take to get the classification right. And then people actually decided that, Jamie, this may be a very good idea, and they followed the plan. In the, as they went along, they discovered a bunch of simple finite groups, and a lot of interesting stuff happened. Uh, so the plan, the proof that emerged was actually according to the expert, remarkably similar to what Bernstein had in mind, uh, had in mind at the beginning, but wasn't uh, identical. So uh, my plan is a two-step plan. First, you need to verify Gebert's argument. This is very hard. I don't want to sort of uh, minimize the difficulties here. This is already tremendously difficult. And then uh, uh, you have to provide some supporting theorems. And this is even harder, if you will. So this is... This is uh, um, not necessarily a, a plan, it's more like a call for help. I think this is a reasonable approach, you be the judge. Uh, I'll try to say what, what needs to be done that will guarantee at least a certain level uh, of, of uh, uh, binding the, the existential threat uh, that comes from AGI, at least the kind of AGI that I'm calling animated. Okay, so uh, the first important point uh, uh, is that uh, the hardware cannot do this. So the tolerable level of existential threat, this is a notion that I think is missing from, from, from the current literature. We have one extinction event uh, in every 100 million years or so. So you add some safety factor, let's say a thousand, then really uh, the, the threat 
is is in the noise. The threat that comes from the noise <coughs> is, is 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 in the noise relative to the cosmic background, which provides us with this rather large uh, ex uh, extinction event. So uh, it requires. Uh, this is the part that is pushed into the appendix. Uh, it requires limiting the uh, uh, the the design uh, to things that have have a, a failure rate of one part in ten to the sixty-four plus s. That's a very large number. At this point, uh, the best thing we can do is maybe between five to twelve significant uh, digits. Actually, you can't even get, get as far as that with, with gravity. But uh, uh, on the whole, sort of current day. Uh, engineering and physics and everything is reliable on the uh, nano scale, but not on the people scale yet. So there is more discussion of this if you get the time. So if it cannot be done in the hardware, then it must be done in the software, right? That's very simple. Uh, how can we do this? Uh, what we need are inescapable moral guarantees. And the stronger the logic of the processor, the more binding they should become. Okay, that's the kind of thing that we need. And fortunately, there is something that supplies this, and this is the ethical rationalism of Alan Weavers. Um, but before coming to the rationalism, I want to say a few things about the reliability of physics and math as we understand it today. Uh, um, this is from every few years, there is, there is a reassessment of the fundamental uh, physical constants of the universe based on the latest results from all kind of very, very sophisticated uh, experiments. These are called the code data recommended values. They come out every four or five years. Now they are set to come out every two years. Uh, the point is that uh, there is this, this, this uh, one value uh, which changed, in fact it shifted more by 6.5 times than the uncertainty that they had before. So actually, they sort of have uh, egg on their face at this point. And the result, as they say quite plainly, was the discovery and correction of an error in the theoretical expression. Okay, So it wasn't even the measurements at all. It was the math. The logic wasn't quite thought through, and something needed to be fixed. Okay, uh, And uh, now look at the reliability of math alone. So. You take something like uh, uh, the odd order theorem. It's a very simple uh, uh, theorem with a very complex proof, which uh, <coughs> fills an entire issue of the Pacific Journal of Mathematics, uh, 255 pages. It was done by two humans uh, uh, in two years. And a mechanical proof that was back in 63 was just uh, announced uh, this year. And so, so 50 years later, a mechanical proof uh, uh, comes by, uh, which took 15 people about six years to actually get the theorem prover through uh, uh, its basis. And these 15 people had to work six years only because there were uh, Bender and Glauberman on the one hand and Peter Falvey on the other hand, who actually took the trouble to write up the uh, proof in a much cleaner way before they could even start the, the full uh, formalization. So if you look at something like the Gorenstein program resulted in the classification of simple finite groups, this was 100 plus humans, right? Uh, the proof, uh, and these humans are not everyday humans. These are like Enrico Bombieri and these kind of guys, uh, serious people who uh, devoted good parts of their lives to, uh, you know, Jacques Tietz, really serious people. So uh, they uh, spent untold number of person years on this thing, and the proof is, is, is 2,000 pages, as it, 20,000 pages as it stands. Uh, and the hive mind is sort of convinced that this is right, uh, but the second generation proof will still be 5,000 pages, so that's uh, a factor of plenty more uh, than, than uh, the old order theorem. And the mechanized proof is not, in, not inside, it's nowhere near. The sort of fate of the art in theorem proving is nowhere near. Uh, to get to this thing. So here is Gavir's main argument, um, which is uh, 380 pages in its original uh, format, uh, with about 5,000 pages of subsequent argument. And we must say that the high mind is not uniformly convinced about it. So um, the reliability of uh, uh, rational argument. I'll, I'd like to start with a simple uh, example, Zillow's theorem, will be familiar to many people in this audience. Uh, uh, if a finite group uh, 
uh, the order of a group is divisible by some, uh, some uh, p to the n for p prime. There exist subgroups h of order p to the n and they are isomorphic. So everybody learns this as sort of intro group theory stuff. So now the hive mind is absolutely certain about this. Uh, you can join the hive mind yourself by, by studying the proof. The, the Koch formal verification is 350 lines with 15 definitions, 90 theorems, and it took two people two weeks to get this uh, formal proof. So you can compare this to the uh, previous thing about uh, the Thompson theorem. Uh, now, if you're a finite group of this uh, uh, size, uh, it doesn't matter what you believe about your subgroups of order p to the n. You have some, they are isomorphic, and I can rely on you having them, even if I don't know your multiplication table. Uh, if you're delusional about not having any, I can take advantage of this. <laughs> so, uh, and that's a, a main point here that the degree of belief, this has nothing to do with sort of Bayesian reasoning and degree of belief. The degree of belief is totally irrelevant. According to the uh, received theological doctrine, which originates with uh, St. Anselm of Canterbury and St. Thomas Aquinas, not even an omnipotent God can create a finite uh, group that lacks uh, civil subgroups. Okay, that's just the way it is. So now we come to ethical rationalism. Uh, uh, so far, what have we done so far? We have bound all future artificial general intelligences to respect civil theory. They can do wonderful things with finite groups, uh, they can dwarf human intellect, uh, uh, but they still cannot build a group with uh, this many elements that will have no subgroup of order nine, and they can square the circle with ruler and compass and so forth. Uh, what we need to do, and this is the program, Gabriel's program basically, is to bind them to ethical principles the same way. Uh, so a good start is the golden rule. Uh, prospective purposive agents, uh, uh, PPAs, have strong claim rights to their freedom and well-being. Okay? Uh, once you get this as a theorem, then the AGIs can escape it no more than they can escape the civil theorems. So what is the argument and how do we turn it into a theorem? Uh, so, uh, the premise is that you are a prospective purposive agent who can act with purpose and reason rationally. So, Gavrius doesn't go into great detail about the acting ability, but it's very clear that ordinary human actions are within scope for him. And the reasoning ability is sophisticated. It is not at all clear how anybody who is not trained in modern Western philosophy can follow this entire chain of argumentation that he puts forward. So. Um, and the conclusion from this, this premise uh, is that uh, all uh, uh, PPAs, not just you, uh, have rights to their freedom and well-being. And this is known as the, uh, the principle of generic consistency of PGC. Okay? And from the PGC, many further conclusions can be drawn in terms of how institutions need to be set up, about rewards, punishments, and stuff, legal systems. I'm not going to go into those. Uh, so the sketch of the argument that this is now I'm trying to uh, uh, follow uh, as a, a reasonable summary of the argument, but the summary itself runs to, uh, to 60 pages. So uh, don't expect me to argue each point individually. So uh, the first you get to uh, get to uh, talk, you talk to this 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 uh, AGI that you're talking to. And you, you make it admit that, that it intends to do something voluntarily for some purpose, at least some of the time. Okay, humans, you know, you argue with a fellow philosopher and they will readily grant you this point. That they are actually prospective uh, purposive agents. Okay, this is not so easy for AGI, so I'm going to get to that uh, later. Uh, and then from this it, it follows that I have a valuation, I have some utility uh, that makes this, uh, this, whatever my purpose E is, it makes it good. By my definition of good, this doesn't have to be morally good or good in some objective sense. It just has to be uh, good uh, by my definition of good. And then this is something that is very uh, closely related to, to Omohundra's notion of the basic AI drives uh, that, uh, that Gebir says that my freedom and well-being are generically necessary conditions of my agency. So freedom and well-being are, if you will, are, 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 are basic drives. Whatever is this purpose E that I have, turns out that to pursue it with any hope of success, I need to have my freedom and well-being. Okay, so I will develop strategies to have my freedom and well-being preserved. Uh, 
And this means that I will consider them necessary goods, uh, which means that I can claim rights to this, I can defend this against the interference uh, by other PPAs. Uh, and if I can uh, do this, it turns out then uh, other PPAs by reflection argument have a claim right to their own freedom and well-being. <laughs> And if this is so, then every PPA has a claim right to their uh, freedom and well-being. This is what uh, we want to get. Okay, so uh, how good is this argument? Um, this is a, a quote from one of the assessments. Gevers gives every appearance of having developed a watertight case, for its arguments are set out with enormous deductive rigor and a frightening dialectical skill. <laughs> to read Gevers is to experience the sense of being caught in an ever-tightening net from which all conceivable avenues of escape have been blocked in advance. This is philosophy as philosophy, <laughs> and Gevers comes quite close to the extreme of propounding arguments so powerful that they set up reverberations in the brain if the person refuses to accept the conclusion, it dies. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, Gevers' arguments are not flashing. They do not proceed by introducing widely bizarre examples at crucial points. Uh, there is no delight in puzzlements for its own sake or contrary to fact conditions imposed on imaginary beings hopefully making moral decisions. Rather, Gevers proceeds by, uh, by relentlessly piling reason upon reason for thinking that his conclusions are true, and by answering in advance almost every argument for thinking otherwise. So this doesn't mean that the high mind is convinced, right? So there's uh, uh, philosophers like E.J. Bond in particular says, by Gevers' argument, moral evil is reduced to logical error. Gevers and he, others like him would turn wickedness into a kind of in, con, intellectual incompetence. Uh, and Kai Nielsen, who says that the very central thesis that there is a substantive supreme principle of morality, the denial of which is self-contradictory, just has to be wrong. And the task is to locate the place or places where such an argument went wrong. Okay? So clearly not everybody likes the conclusion. And uh, what I'm proposing here is that, is that uh, we cannot have this sort of uh, clever philosophers debate this thing. This is not sufficient. What you need to do is to harden this to a, a, a real formal proof. Okay? Once you have a formal pro proof at hand, uh, then it becomes very hard to, to, uh, for clever people to, or AGIs uh, to argue with it. Uh, so, what you need is this sort of some kind of logical deduction of this thing. Uh, how you do that? Uh, the logic has four parts. It has some language describing the expressions we are interested in, some rules for deriving conclusions from premises, some methods to see whether a given rule is applicable, and some methods to see whether the premises are met. And this is hard in philosophy because the language used is natural language, and the deduction is used is somewhat informal. And whether to see, uh, see whether uh, a rule is applicable, we do this by some kind of soft pattern matching. And the methods to see whether pre uh, premises are met, uh, the grounding of the thing is, is somewhat weak. So this is sort of what makes the task hard. Uh, but the fact that the task is hard doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's impossible. A good argument can be pretty compelling. So Aquinas has this argument that even God can create a mountain without creating a valley. <coughs> And we say that this is, we formulate this as for every x create x mountain, therefore create x valley. Okay? Uh, there were natural language issues, but they are not insurmountable, right? Everybody will agree who knows uh, uh, English or Latin that to the extent that you can prove the formula, you have proved what Aquinas uh, set out to prove, and to the extent you fail here, uh, you expose the fault in the original argument. Uh, so, of course, you need some rules for deriving conclusions from the premises. In particular, you need a hidden premise that the mountain is defined as land higher than surrounding land. So, if this is so, then by substitution, if x creates land higher than surrounding land, then some land z lower than y was created by side effect, and the soft pattern matching takes this to be the valley, and we have the proof. Okay? If the definitions are reasonable, the conclusion is inevitable. And weak grounding is actually not a problem. The same logic applies to electric potential uh, or everywhere else where comparing heights would make sense. So, in fact, it just generalizes what we have to say. So, uh, the main thrust here is that the lack of precision hardware dictates a specific work plan. We have to demonstrate that only the intellectually incompetent are wicked. Right? <laughs> uh, this is, you know, I like this formulation. Uh, um, 
So philosophers will, will grant you uh, the premise that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that they are they are PPAs, and it is not the logic of the argument uh, that is co uh, is that complicated as the commonsensical uh, assumptions that Gevers is relying on. And I'm gonna try to accelerate this a little bit, <coughs> a little bit, and skip over. Uh, you do need like temporal logic, you need a, a, some kind of action logic, you need a lot of sophisticated logic to go into a proof like this uh, um, that I'm going to try to skip over and get to the real difficulties. This is the, there are difficulties already in sort of turning a very informal argument into a formal proof, but there are even heavier uh, difficulties ahead. Uh, so we are not quite out of the woods yet. Uh, uh, there are three areas I'd like to briefly touch upon. The paper actually has more detail about them than I have here time to present. Uh, one is difficulties regarding recognition of humans as PPAs. Okay, you have this AGI, it is already convinced. So from here onwards, I just assume that we succeeded in the program uh, and we turned Gebrich's argument into a formal theorem and the PPA has digested it the same way it would digest Silo's theorem and would say yes, all right, so this is the way it is, okay? Uh, so the second problem is self-deception. That was, uh, uh, Hibbert called this self-delusion. We are talking essentially about the same thing here. Uh, uh, we can have AGIs in some kind of conflicted and contradictory state. So uh, that's a serious issue. And uh, finally, there is something about the fitness of deductive systems that I'd like to get to. Uh, so how do we recognize PPAs? Well, how do we recognize humans? Turns out uh, uh, we com uh, come with, with a piece of hardware called uh, mirror neurons that do this. Actually, birds already have mirror neurons. So this has uh, been around evolutionary for a while now. Uh, um, the, the hardware is non-detachable, so it's not like we have an external recognizer module that some clever uh, guy could detach or feed false information to or do something with. It's 13% uh, um, uh, of monkey ventral premotor cortex is, has mirror functions. Few people would uh, 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 sort of willingly part with 13% of their brain. Okay, so, um, and then there is sort of one thing we can, can do here is that uh, PPAs uh, upon reflection may want to equip themselves with PPA recognition ca capabilities. So they may consider it ethical not to sort of step on other PPAs by accident and make sure that they recognize the PPAs uh, if they are around. So the next issue is self-deception, very big issue. Uh, so it is uh, basically central to moral philosophy since Kant, Kierkegaard, Sartre, anybody who's, who's uh, uh, doing moral philosophy in the past few hundred years was concerned with this and uh, with reason. Uh, so there is a hope, this is now more like an essay, it is a faint hope than in, in, in terms of uh, something like a proto theorem that you only have to just, uh, you know, harden up and prove mathematically. No, it's just a hope that uh, there is a hope that perhaps a system that is lacking in unity, uh, it has some kind of processes that are outside the process table, uh, is perhaps less efficient than one with unity. Now, there is no guarantee of this, right? And I'm not saying this, uh, but uh, maybe this is a possible line of attack. And there is also the, the issue of sort of not willing to be, of, of despair, existential despair, not willing to be oneself, that one needs to consider here. This is uh, somewhat related to this aversion mechanism that was uh, 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 discussed earlier. Um, finally, the fitness of the deductive systems. Uh, so if we have two AGIs, A and B, one with better logic than the other, which one will assimilate the other? Well, the hope is that it's the one with the better logic. So. Uh, what we need here, people will be familiar, or many people will be familiar with Lindstrom's theorem that shows that sort of first order uh, predicate calculus is in some sense optimal among uh, the uh, class of logical formalisms. Uh, and we need the son of Lindstrom's theorem uh, that says that those logics that prove uh, the principle of generic consistency are more fit than those that don't. Again, this is a hope. Uh, we would need to develop such a, uh, uh, such a theorem because uh, uh, once we have this, then we get back to this, uh, again, was touched in, in, in uh, the earlier presentation, so, some kind of societal control uh, so, uh, uh, of, of 
of, of AGIs. Well, maybe this guy doesn't want to uh, uh, behave nicely, but this other guy, uh, uh, he's more efficient because he's proving the son of an instrument theorem, and he's more efficient and, and therefore can assimilate uh, the previous guy. So the hope is that all of this can be played out in the theorem prover ahead of time. So there's a bit of boxing involved here. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the final conclusion that to secure this bound uh, requires experts there is not just in robotics and AGI, but also philosophers and logicians must be invited to the party. Thank you. Questions? Complaints? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not entirely sure if maybe perhaps I missed the point, but uh, you made quite a big deal about the mirror neurons and uh, the, the fact that they're built into us basically as a system and maybe this is an advantage. And I was thinking about, well, um, how do human act, agents act towards one another? And of course, we sometimes reclassify other human agents. So, for example, we'll say, "Well, this is a subhuman." Yeah, right. This is self-deception, right? This is yeah. this is there's there's two different issues. One, there is sort of the the uh, inherent cognitive difficulty of recognizing something different from you as being a PPA. So, for example, to take an actual example from the world, you know, citations. You know, there is uh, just this year, the, I think the American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, passed the resolution saying that dolphins must be uh, they given sort of proto-human rights. They, they, have, they cannot, this the treatment of dolphins has got to stop, okay? Uh, it's, uh, it's been only, you know, uh, since, the uh, since the 50s that people realized that this treatment of black people has got to stop, right? Uh, I mean, uh, this is, uh, um, there's the genuine cognitive problem of recognizing the other as being, being a PPA, okay? Uh, for which hardware acceleration may be helpful, okay? Uh, and then this other issue now is that uh, you know, you already know that of course this is an intelligent being uh, and, and you should not harm them. Uh, what you do anyway? This is sort of, sort of mocking. Uh, you're lying to yourself. You're you're getting into a self-delusional state. Your hardware is already telling you uh, uh, that, that that these things need to be left alone. Ben, um, could you could you roll back to the side where you gave the summary of your the person, work? argument? The person with the microphone is the person here. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Your name said Ben. So yeah, sorry. Uh, it's true. You'll be next. I'm sorry. Um, but it seems to me obvious that you could have instrumentally effective reasoning in the service of pretty much any goal. I wasn't sure whether you were denying that or whether you were just saying that even if you had something that was superhumanly instrumentally efficient at figuring out the right means to achieve a certain goal would not count uh, as being one of these purposeful agents or having rationality label attached to it. Okay, so the, the full paper has a discussion of, uh, uh, has a discussion of Attila de Hon, who I consider to be one of these, these uh, uh, highly intelligent agents, who nevertheless is incapable of understanding Gebert's argument. She lived too long ago, and this whole argument is too sophisticated for him. And he's doing all kind of nasty things uh, as, as the scourge of God, right? So there is this higher being behind him, and he is acting as an instrument uh, uh, in, in, in this situation. So no, I'm not denying the possibility of large amounts of intelligence, uh, uh, instrumental intelligence, as, as you said, being brought on any particular task, be it uh, a good task or bad task or however you value it. Uh, I'm not denying that at all. All I'm saying is that uh, um, uh, <coughs> but, uh, to the extent it's such task, uh, such agents may still entirely, I don't want to call them agents, I want to call them instruments. So, uh, uh, to the extent that they have, uh, it, to the extent it blindly follows its utility function, it's, it doesn't meet uh, our definition of what we consider an agent. Okay. So it's not clear why it solves the safety problem, if you have this really dangerous AI that is mm -hmm. really instrumentally effective in achieving a useful goal, then sort of proving that it doesn't deserve the label agent. 
doesn't necessarily yield any protection. It no, 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 the protection is offered to the extent it's offered by other agents that are hopefully more powerful uh, by virtue of having a more powerful logic which actually will uh, make them subject uh, to the principle of generic consistency. So they themselves, as instruments, they can be very dangerous if they think of automated tanks or what have you. You know, they can be very intelligent agent and they can do nasty things. Uh, but then, then you really, you know, ask yourself how do you control them? Basically, the only way to control them is to have even more powerful agents that actually have some some smidgen of conscience here, right? So that's that's the only way to control them. You cannot control them by bringing in more powerful, also uh, completely uh, uh, wicked instruments. That's not. It's just going to be an arms trade. So that's not leading you to any nice place. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit curious about this, this argument that this whole line of thinking is based on. I, I wonder, to ask my question, I need you to slide back yeah, yeah, no, 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 to the slide that, that gave the, the summary of Gewerf's argument. I'm working on it. Yeah, here. Yes, so all it, right. It, 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 it seems that the step I don't quite understand is from, so my... my my freedom of well-being are necessary goods. I can kind of, I can kind of guess what that means. They're, they're necessary for, for me, for that guy. That's right. Now the next step, I have a claim right. Now I can see how, from that step to the next. Okay, he, he's assuming some reflection principle that if I have a right, anyone like me should also have that right. But I, yeah. I don't see how you get from. I'm free, sorry. Free, I, free, I, free, I don't see how you get from freedom of well-being. I'm sorry. We're going from this step. To this step? No, before. Okay. Uh, so you get from this free, step? Yeah, from freedom of well-being being necessary for me and my agency to the idea that you have some sort of claim right, whatever that means. That, that, that seems like a rather big leap. And I, I, I wonder, how is that a logical argument without introducing some weird premises? Okay, we're not going to be able to, to uh, do this on the basis uh, of, you know, uh, what these capsule formulations mean, okay? Because Pierre is very precise about uh, the meaning of all these terms. So there's, no, there's no possible intuitive summary of the argument? There is no royal road, okay? This is like asking somebody to prove the, I don't know, Jordan Curve theorem in five minutes. It's just kind of been done, right? Uh, the argument, long, complex, uh, Gebirs, you know, easily spends uh, 30 pages on arguing, for example, that you have a moral duty to rescue others when they endanger themselves. Okay, this is not something like that you can, you know, uh, show the gist of the argument. It's, it's, think of the classification of the finite groups. I mean, no, oh, sorry. All right. <laughs> I, I, I don't buy it whatsoever. That's fine. That obviously, that that step is the crucial step where where criticism would say it's the naturalistic fallacy which happens, right? So that would be... Well, I'm not, I'm not sure, because there is uh, uh, there is this wonderful uh, uh, book that does uh, Mishka and says, if you can show I have people. A, I have okay, a book. so this is like, I don't know, four or five hundred page book. I need to... Uh, I have a book which tries yeah, to discuss yeah, yeah. objections. Uh, Every, people, of course, about, about each inference here, people do, many people write papers that this particular inference is wrong. So uh, this particular guy uh, tries to restate argument and address all of them. So it's, it's, it's a big phone or something. I can't hear what you're saying. Ah. Who has I'm, I'm the person who had raised their hand? <coughs> I don't remember my Okay. So I like <laughs> just. Uh, all right. I'll try to make this quick. Uh, you said right at the top that <coughs> this was an argument for animated agents and not automatic agents. Correct. I, confused about what the actual distinction between that is because your description was about like blindly following and having its own purposes which i can't cash out in terms of like what it means for the actual design decisions of the software that the ai is running could you give an example of what those design decisions could be no i can give you no i cannot give you give you uh, because nobody has so far designed uh, conscious uh, you know uh, AI agents, so or AGI agents. So, the, so the answer is no. I cannot tell you what is the critical element of design. You know, in in popular literature, this happens sort of uh, mythically. This uh, you know, uh, 
build it and they will come. You build this more and more powerful computational system and eventually, on, I don't know, December uh, 1997, uh, it acquires consciousness, right? And decides to kill humanity or something like that. It's, uh, so there is no answer what I mean by a specific design method that, that will let you achieve uh, conscious, uh, 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 purposeful agents with free will. We do have instances, we have humans who fit this definition very well, but we actually don't fully understand what makes them tick, right? So, uh, so I cannot give you a, 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 a definition that is based on some kind of uh, criteria. I can give you uh, an ostensive definition. Humans fit the bill, computers don't. <laughs> so, no, well, you're, you're laughing at this, but, but uh, I challenge you to provide any definition. Uh, you know, you give me uh, the software that, that uh, you know, reasonable people would consider conscious or, or purposive. Uh, what? Exactly more than one element of each category to help people generalize. <laughs> well, well, we don't have other examples. You know, well, yeah. people will argue, to some extent there is primatologists argue uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, hominids, uh, you know, uh, Certainly, higher uh, ordinary apes, orangutans, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos uh, are purposive agents. Okay, uh, whether goldfish are is highly debated, right? Most people think that they are not. Uh, so, but even that is debatable. So, how do I give you many examples? Humans, hominids. That's the that's the pool that we are working with at the moment. Okay, so a bit of follow up. So I also, when I was reading this, I also didn't believe most exactly the inference that Ben didn't believe. I also like didn't and don't believe that claim rights follow from necessary goods. But it's, it's a large field. For every of these inferences, there were at least a couple of papers which said that no, they are not true. And uh, this is uh, and this particular volume is. Uh, discusses them all and tries to address them all, and that's not the original author. So it's uh, basically, uh, I, I personally think right now for me, I keep an open mind because it's obviously not something which can judgment whether it's true or false can be formed very quickly. It would require some labor of looking at it. And so the, the, the book is uh, by by Derek Bell very direct common necessity of morality. Right. And, and it's certainly well written and it's well done. Well, then, what, what point of view is right? That's my question. Probably well open. So my level book is actually cited in the, in the, in the paper, so people will not have a hard ah. time finding it. Uh, is, is your paper available? The paper was, that was on the last side somewhere. Uh, the papers are in the proceedings, and the proceedings no, are no. It's no, not no, that's not in the AGI. This is this is AGI. This fact which doesn't have proceedings. So, um, so you can read it under cornide.com slash drafts with a capital D. So the AGI 12 to PDI. So we, we will have proceedings, but they are bound to be published after the meeting. We thought that the discussions in the meeting should inform the papers. Okay. So one last thing if I may add before I should try to move on to the to the next speaker. Um, may, may I add one more thing? Just brief? Very brief. Very brief. <laughs> very brief. Uh, so I am not the first person actually who thinks that this plan of protecting from the automata is best done by endowing uh, uh, machines with morality. So this is actually has a large literature behind uh, it, uh, which I'm trying to put in the paper. Uh, I don't find this a novel, uh, a novel idea, but I think it's a very valid idea. If you don't endow them with morality, uh, certainly all of these pro pro problems uh, uh, that, that was wearing a post pistol and wire heading and other side effects uh, are here to stay. So you really have to have some kind of moral compass. Uh, uh, this is one possible avenue of approaching that. That's, that's all I'm trying to say here. The nice thing about it is that, it, it, that Gabriel's overt goal is not to do this by, you know, stone tablets uh, directly handed to Moses by God. So this, you don't base this on external uh, axioms. You just base it on uh, pure logical deduction. That's sort of the uh, part that makes it more convincing than the rest of such efforts. Thank you. Thank you.